I want to welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. The first two have been wonderful um, events for us, and uh, I hope everybody got a chance to enjoy those. Um, this one, I think, will be equally memorable, um, mainly because we've got what I've told are beef rendang burritos back there that are they're supposed to be wonderful. So uh, make sure that, and the chicken sandwiches, I've told her, are fantastic as well. So I hope everybody enjoys that, along with the Prosecco. Um, this is part of our year-long commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the American Club. So it just seems like we've been here 350 years. It's only been 70 years. And um, we're very lucky to have tonight Jim Baker, who's been a member for almost all of those 70 years. Not, not quite. Uh, but uh, he's certainly no stranger to our community. Uh, he's lived in Singapore for most of his life. I think he went away for college for a couple of years. And uh, sowed some wild oats, came back, and, and shared it with the kids at the American School. For You were a, a teacher there for about... Um, 92 years, right? It was back, if I, if I remember correctly. I, I've known Jim an, an awfully long time. Um, they've been members, uh, Jim and Junia have been members of the club for 24 years. Uh, he was 35 years, actually, at the American School, uh, where he was a mentor, coach, and a teacher there. Um, Jim's published four actually wonderful books. I, I've read uh, three out of the four, and... Um, Two of them are available at our, our library upstairs. Crossroads, which is about uh, Malaysia and Singapore, and Eagle in the Lion City. Um, great reads. I would highly recommend them. Uh, we, he is now working on a commemorative book for the American Club about some of this history. It's going to be a wonderful party gift for uh, our, our Christmas gift, I guess, is when it comes out. Um, we've redone a whole bunch of pictures that Jim's been able to find. Uh, we've we've reconstituted them. Jim's put the text with them. I think it's going to be really interesting. Some of the pictures are, were literally unearthed in, in morgues and, and places that you wouldn't find them and then fixed up so that they look practically brand new. Um, now, this talk this evening is about From Eagle's Nest to Trade Winds, and that's our most popular outlet. Um, it's been closed for a little over a year now. Jim knows nothing about when it's going to open. So <laughs> don't ask him, because I know nothing about when it's going to open. It, it will open, I guarantee it. Um, it'll open relatively soon. We've been doing a lot of work. I spent most of the day in there trying to get the extractors working so everybody doesn't smell like hamburgers after they're done. Um, but we're getting relatively close because we were actually able to cook some hamburgers while we were uh, in there trying to get the extractors right. So it's coming soon. Um, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a brand new space. Um, we're really looking forward to being able to get the lobby open. I, we've been sitting there for weeks now, being able to take peeks here and there of things. I, I've got the furniture all set up. So as soon as we're able, as soon as we make sure that the wallpaper doesn't fall off the walls and you're not tripping over the tiles, then we'll get that all open and, and ready to go. All right. Jim, we'd like to welcome you here. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Sometimes people just don't like to see 
those kinds of things change. Okay. So what I'm going to what I'm going to try to do tonight is try to kind of explain why Tradewinds is a good name for the major outlet at the American Club in Singapore. Uh, if we so. Why should we call it trade goods? And why is that such an appropriate name for the most popular outlet at the club? Okay. So if we go if we go back to the people who began who started the club. And if you went up to the top floor of the cafe building, where the club was, it's basically a bar besides that. This is the view you would have seen. It's pretty close to it, because the cafe building looked over the Singapore River. And that's Collier Key, Raffles Place, Bank of China building, if you're looking for references. Okay? So this, while the club was active, the Cathay building. This is what downtown Singapore looked like. And it was about trade. Not entirely, but it, this was about trade. This city that you're looking at. You can see the, the port over there. You can see the bum boats. Anyway. And next to that, actually, is a, a poster that, that was made for, for a, a, a World's Fair kind of thing about America is trading with China. And so you've got a clipper ship, and you've got a flying boat, the first planes that came to Singapore from America on Pan American World Airways. The international airport was in the Kawang Basin. Seaplanes came in. Uh, it was only after World War II it became an international airport with a runway and that kind of thing. And the ship there is from a company called the Dollar Line, which was a predecessor to American President Lines. Um, but that's why the Americans were here, mostly, because there are other stories about missionaries and, and that kind of thing. But for the people who started the club, these people, that's where they were. And it was a town club. It didn't even serve food, right? It was a bar and a pool hall for, for a bunch of men who worked in that area of town. It was close by. They loved it. Even when the baby boom came and people started having families and kids, a whole bunch of them didn't want to move. They wanted a town club. Basically, is what they wanted. Well, that city you're looking at, when... Singapore became independent, was the fifth largest port in the world. The fifth busiest port in the world. And a big part of that was America. And the, the, the trade between America and Singapore was an important part of Singapore's success and the foundation that was laid for independent Singapore and independent Singapore's economic success. But that was their view. And these guys were in trade. And that's why most of them were here. Just a couple posters. The first, the prop version of the 747, it's called a Stratocruiser. It had beds in it. it. Took you five days to get to the States. Uh, I don't know if we should, that would be a poster for Singapore today, but anyway. I've always asked people, what does it say in Chinese? But I never found out. Um, so, 
we talk about contributions to American trade in Singapore. One contribution was speed. And there are three pictures here. The one on the left is the clipper ship Staghound. The one on the right, if, the, if you've lived, depending on how old you are, if you remember where Suntec City is today, there used to be boogies ships that would come and land on that beach there off of what was called Beach Road. And uh, this painting on the right is of a boogie ship. Well, an American opium runner, and what we mean by opium runner was that the East, East India Company had a monopoly on the opium trade in these waters. And so Americans were trying, the problem America had in trading with Singapore was they didn't have anything Singapore wanted or very few things, but opium was. But they had to be faster than the East India Company, the East India Company ships. And so they would, uh, the first clipper ships with full sail were fast. And they were faster than most of the East India men. And so one of those guys, uh, I think his name was Waterman, took a boogie ship the hull of it, took it back to the States and gave it to a guy named John McKay, who was one of the great engineers of, of the clipper ships. Because the clipper ships are a part of American folklore, uh, the clipper ships around the horn. They cut the, the sailing time between the west coast of the United States and Asia in half. Well, that was a big contribution. In fact, at one time, there were British traders in Singapore, a free trade port, who, who wanted to ban the Americans from coming in because their ships were so fast. And people said, well, why don't you make fast ships too? Uh, and this, is, this picture here is a painting of the Stag Hound in 1851 in Singapore Harbor because they took the hull of a boogie ship back to the States and then put all this sail power on it. And people didn't believe that it, it would be seaworthy. Well, the boogies built their ships to run from the Dutch. So you got the clipper here. It wasn't that long because, but anyway, when the Staghound comes back to Singapore, it's like a homecoming because it was built on a boogies model but with a lot more sail. Um, in the bottom here is the Confederate ship Alabama. Uh, and it showed up in Southeast Asia because it was trying to attack Union shipping in Southeast Asia during the American Civil War because America needed tin, or the Union needed tin uh, because they were feeding a million-man army and they had come up with new methods of tin canning and they needed the tin to do it. And then after the war was over, the American petroleum industry increased the demand for tin dramatically too. So the American canning industry, the American petroleum industry together created great demand for tin. Once again though, the problem the Americans had was what do we trade for it? Uh, the Brits were making a lot of money off of it. But now, in the second half of the 19th century, America industrialized. And a number of historians will tell you that Singapore's economic success and as a port was, as, was more because of the American Industrial Revolution than the British Industrial Revolution. Because tin and then later rubber were in great demand in America. Uh, and so you had this Americans buying huge amounts of tin and rubber from this part of the world, but what did we sell them? Well, one company that figured out was Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil. And in the 1890s, because that will be the, the beginning of Singapore as a petroleum product hub, is in the 1890s when Standard Oil comes to Singapore. There we're talking about kerosene. 
this is a kerosene go down. You see the tin cans here. Well, what they figured out long before Verizon or anybody else did, if you took a kerosene lantern and gave it to people, like Verizon says, we'll sell you a phone for a dollar, only buy our program, right? Well, Standard Oil figured out that if we give people this, give it to them, they got to buy our kerosene to make it go. And for a while, they had a monopoly. It would take a little bit of time before Royal Dutch Shell came in. And even then, it was only a duopoly. Because, uh, well, at the time, this is a movie that was made in the 1930s, Oil for the Lamps of China. So it wasn't just a question of giving people stuff so they buy your kerosene. At that time, everybody was looking at China, not unlike recently. They looked at China. At that time, China had a population of about 300 million people. And they said, if we pass out 20 million kerosene lanterns, look at the market we will get, like many American businessmen. A billion people will get rich. In actual fact, their most profitable market was in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia was, standard of living was rising faster than China's. Its population was growing. And that would establish Singapore as a petroleum center. By the 1970s and 1980s, people called Singapore the Houston of Asia. And after kerosene, it would become a bunkerage area for, for petroleum goods lubricants. And then after that, gasoline. But it was also franchised, too, that, that the mobile brand, the flying horse brand of mobile oil, had franchises all through Southeast Asia that Standard Oil in Singapore serviced. And so you had an American company that actually found something they could sell besides opium in Southeast Asia. Because uh, opium wasn't good because you had to buy it first, right? Well, this America at that time was producing 85% of the world's petroleum and 65% of it was being exported. So we have this standard oil throughout Malaysia, throughout Indonesia, standard oil made their mark, although first with kerosene. The lantern was called the Beifu lantern. I think it means beautiful companion. Uh, but Oil for the Lamps of China, was a, a book written about standard oil in China. And uh, then they made a movie about it in the 1930s about standard oil in China. And, and they were talking about the civil unrest in China. And the book is highly inaccurate, but it was a bestseller. And the movie was really popular, too. Oil from the lamps of China. That's why when people say that to this very day, right? When people, Americans say, OK, we're going to go to China, and we're going to sell 30 million of this thing. And people go, oil for the lamps of China, right? We've heard this line before. Um, and everybody was going to get rich from China. But what really put Singapore on the map was rubber and the American automobile industry. This here is a picture of the Goodyear uh, office in Singapore in 1938. And it becomes an interest. The, the rubber story has an interesting story to it as well. Henry Ford, and everybody knows Henry Ford, right? And it's named Charles Firestone. It, does Firestone still exist as a rubber company? Anyway, I, do they still make I don't know. I don't drive a car. Um, anyway, after World War I, the vast majority of the natural rubber in the world was coming out of Singapore. And uh, the world price of rubber was established. In the noonday price of rubber in Singapore was the world price of rubber. It was the only commodity like that, that where the prices were set outside of London and New York. And, and that's so Henry Ford got together with Charles Firestone, and they were upset because the British 
controlled the rubber market completely. And he didn't like that. And he wanted to make America independent of British, Malaya, and Singapore so they didn't have to buy the rubber there. Ford would open up a place in Brazil called Fordlandia, where he goes to Brazil and clears the jungle and builds this utopian society, town that he thought was going to be an alternative to British Malaya. Firestone goes to Liberia. You probably couldn't choose two worst countries to go to at that time in history to try to make money. Fordlandia is reclaimed by the jungle. It had all sorts of problems with disease and labor. And Firestone carried on in Liberia, but not very well. The reason is that they could not recreate the infrastructure that existed in Singapore. The infrastructure of trade for tin and rubber and later palm oil was so sophisticated in Singapore that Goodyear realized, this is stupid. Why look for alternatives? Let's just develop our markets here in Southeast Asia uh, as buying, buying things. And Goodyear, Goodyear still buys rubber. I mean, what saved the natural rubber industry was the AIDS epidemic. Uh, because natural, natural rubber was on a serious decline until AIDS came to Western society and gloves and condoms had to use latex. They couldn't use artificial rubber. Anyway, um, but Goodyear refused to do it. And they didn't lose money like Ford did in, in Brazil and, and Firestone did in Liberia. And they, they actually ended up doing a lot of the, I mean, they, their company prospered much better than the other ones. And because they stayed, they realized the trade infrastructure here is in Singapore, and they stayed and benefited from it. Now, at the same time, the 1920s, another group of Americans, the problem America had was that our industrialization took place behind tariffs. And so American businesses had no great desire to cater their products to the rest of the world. They had a closed home market. And so there were some things, like what Standard Oil did, right, where you could find markets. And a number of American trading companies, of people who were what people used to call Asian hands, they knew the area, they, they knew the, the markets, became agents for all these American companies. Here's some examples. Uh, there were four major American trading companies in Singapore that come in the 1920s and 30s. Muller and Phipps, Getz Brothers, Connell Brothers, and Dodge and Seymour. And they had a model somewhat like the British, like Syme Darby, Bowsteads, Guthrie's, these British trading companies that brought products into Southeast Asia to market. And they copied that model, although the British companies owned plantations and such. And so the people who worked for these guys identified products that could sell. And American companies didn't think they could find markets in, in Southeast Asia. And they had failed miserably in China. So they wanted nothing to do with it. These guys became their agents. And the two biggest ones were Muller and Phipps and Getz Brothers. The first president of the American Club, Glenn Parrott, worked for Getz Brothers. The, the president that took the club from the Cathay Building to Scotts Road, Paul Boardwell, worked for Muller and Phipps. So these guys had a huge list of American companies that they marketed in this part of the world. And see, Muller and Phipps, they brought in Quaker Oats. I don't know if, there you have Wrigley's gum. Muller and Phipps was an agent for Wrigley's gum, too. This is a, an ad from 1923. Uh, you know, chew, it's, Muller and Phipps, it says, remember, Wrigley's after every meal. Uh, 
and they were se selling it as a, you know, to improve your breath after you ate your sex. Um, Pietz, so, so Muller and Phipps did R.J. Reynolds' tobacco. It did uh, Wrigley's. It did Ronson's. I mean, it had this whole stable of American products that it marketed in this part of the world. Getz Brothers also um, had, because Motor Phipps had one tobacco company, Getz Brothers had another tobacco company. You know, and, and the Motor Phipps had one kind of American appliance company, Getz Brothers had another American appliance company. So you had all these. And one thing the Getz Brothers did was horses. And because of one of their great, they had three markets for horses. Singapore Turf Club, the Sultan of Johor, and uh, other royal families in Malaysia. And so the Sultan of Johor had very close ties with the American community because of horses because the son of George loved to play polo because that's what the British aristocracy did. And he owned racehorses and, I mean, was very Islamic, but anyway. Uh, and during the 1930s, the son of George would attend the George Washington Ball at, at the, in, when the American community. You would have the governor of, of Singapore, the British governor, and the son of George attending the George Washington Ball. The governor, because the Americans were so important to Singapore's economy, and the Sultan of Johor, because he was buddies with these guys. That close relationship almost turned into the American Club and the American School buying the land between the Botanical Garden and Fair Road. That huge piece of land there that's still undeveloped, it's the I think it's the largest piece of privately owned undeveloped land in Singapore. And they actually had a deal to do it where The American school and the American club, the idea was you get these two together and they put up the money, right? School pays half, club pays half, and we get this beautiful area on Holland Road. Today you could sell it and buy Burma, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't happen because the American school bailed out because the Singapore government offered them a cheap piece of land in Ulupanda, and the club couldn't afford to do it on their own. But they, they, had, they were right, they had gotten agreement from the Sultan of Johor to buy that land. And it was because he had this relationship with these Americans. Um, Muller and Fitz sold 50, they were also the agents for Remington, as in the guns. They sold 50,000 shotguns to the Malaysian police to fight the communists in, in the 1950s. Uh, Colt was Getz, and they were actually, had some real problems because the Venetian government arrested one of their employees because they didn't want him selling guns to rebels in Sumatra. Um, and I just thought this was kind of funny. When you talk about a time capsule, because this is the Straits Times in 1959, okay? so. Muller and Phipps was the agent for maiden form bras. And so they had this international ambassadress or whatever who was Mrs. Maiden form. And her job was to go around the world and convince people to buy maiden form bras. Uh, and, but, just, but just the headlines in the Strange Times. I mean, in today's world, can you imagine? Uh, headlines like that. <laughs> well, and there's all sorts of problems with it, not just Asians. <laughs> You're saying all these Asians are all the same, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, but what these trading companies showed was a market that other companies never realized existed. And in, in the post World War II era, you saw American imports into Singapore, American. Because America's always been looking for something to sell. 
Well, these guys figured out what would sell. And between 1930 and 1960, you would see a huge increase in American imports into Singapore. And then a lot of it distributed, because all these guys had uh, branches in KL, Ipoh, Penang, Jakarta. I mean, they had, they had the whole area covered. Um, it's not true that Asian women's breasts are underdeveloped. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, those three uh, examples of the kinds of people that Glenn Parrott, who was the first president of the club, during World War II served in the British Army in intelligence. He was one of the last guys off the island. Got as far as Ceylon or Sri Lanka today, and then he joined the British Army. Asked him to join because of his knowledge of the area. So he was the guest guy in Singapore. He comes back after the war and becomes the first president. In the first ten years, four of those years, the presidents of the club were these trading companies. But absolutely, eventually, is to buy out an American company. Suddenly realized that yes, there are markets there. Maybe we ought to go after them. Um, Paul Bordwell, but, but the point was that Parrot knew the area, and that's why the British Army gave him a commission during the war. And Paul Bordwell, who was the head of Muller and Phipps, who was in many ways responsible for moving the club from <laughs> Cafe to Scots, had grown up in China. He spoke fluent Chinese during World War II. He had worked for the predecessor to the CIA, the OSS, in China. Uh, and, and so these were the kinds of guys that they had hired. They hired people who knew the area, knew what they could sell in different countries and different places. Uh, that would change, no doubt, in the 70s and 80s. And, and the economies of the area would all change. But, we're talking about traders here, right? We're here to trade. And that's what built the community that built the club, was trade. I mean, today we have, what do we, by about 1970 is when American investment outstrips British investment in Singapore. And now, so America, what were Americans, Americans are now producing in Singapore, and now they produce, provide professional services, I mean, very diverse community. But these guys, who looked out over that, they were traders. And it's appropriate that we name a, a, a part of the club after that group of people. Outbreak of World War II, there were more Dutch or Germans or Japanese in Singapore than there were Americans uh, in terms of, of numbers of expatriates living in Singapore. But that number, I mean, the idea that they were so important to Singapore's trade that when the American Association started, they were given exemption from all societal laws. In other words, there's a Societies Act in Singapore. You have to register. They were exempted from that. When they opened the club at Scott's Road, uh, opened club at Cathay Building, they had no legal standing whatsoever. But the government was willing to look the other way because basically the Americans could do, as far as the Brits were concerned, I mean, the Brits paid off a quarter of their, of their war debt off of rubber and tin in British Malaya between the two wars. And even after World War II, Singapore and Malaya were bringing huge amounts of money into the sterling British coffers at a time when Britain was really in trouble. And that's what these guys understood was when the war was over, those markets the British had were fair game. And these guys realized that. And then they were the victims of their own success. Getz bought Muller and Phipps. And then some company like Trans International 
distributors and corporators that end up buying the books. Mueller Phipps today is still very big in India, Pakistan, and Ceylon. I mean, Sri Lanka. And Guest Brothers still exists here in Singapore today. But owned by other people and vastly different. A lot of them are the pharmaceuticals, chemicals, those kind of specialty items. Uh, these guys sold medical equipment. <coughs> the pharmaceuticals were coming out of Britain at that time. So, like I said, the trade winds coffee shop honors these people. 